Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is probably the most misunderstood idea in quantum mechanics outside of maybe Schrodinger's cat. It was derived in 1926 by an Austrian physicist named Werner Heisenberg, and he won a Nobel Prize later, not just for his work in matrices and describing quantum mechanics or for the uncertainty principle, but he was given the award basically for founding quantum mechanics. So what does the uncertainty principle say? So the equation looks like this. The product of delta x and delta p is greater than or equal to h over 4 pi, where h is Planck's constant. And the delta x and the delta p in this case are not what we're used to with deltas where we talked about change. Delta x is the uncertainty in the position measurement, and delta p is the uncertainty in the momentum measurement, right? And so uncertainty in this case is basically the range of measurements where your value falls in between, right? So for example, if I take a meter stick, and I just measure something with a meter stick, I have a bigger uncertainty than if I flip it and I start measuring in centimeters. And I have less uncertainty if I flip it and measure in millimeters, right? So I've lowered my uncertainty by changing how I measure. So the uncertainty principle basically says there's a limit to how much uncertainty you can get rid of in a measurement. So what it all boils down to is that you can never know the exact speed and the exact position of an object. So let's get this out of the way. The uncertainty principle involves measurement, but it's not just about measurement. So the example a lot of people give when they use the uncertainty principle is measuring the position of an electron. So let's say I have this electron and I wanna see where it's at. If you wanna see where something's at, you need to take a photon and hit it and bounce it off. And that photon needs to come back to your eye or your instrument or whatever it is so that you can tell where that electron was, right? But by you shining a photon on that electron, that electron's not going to be there anymore. It's going to hit and it's going to move off and the momentum and the position of that electron has changed. So you're not really measuring where it's at, you're measuring where it was, right? And so a lot of people say, oh, well, that's an example of the uncertainty principle. And I mean, yes, it's kind of an example. And even Heisenberg used this example in his paper in 1926. But the uncertainty principle is so much more fundamental than just this. At its core, the uncertainty principle gets at the idea that things on an atomic scale have both particle properties and wave properties. So first, let's look at something big, like a baseball, right? So if I take this baseball and I throw it up at about two meters per second, this baseball is gonna have a wavelength of about three times 10 to the minus 32nd meters. And this is coming from uh, de Broglie's relationship that wavelength equals Planck's constant divided by the momentum of the object, right? So this ball, something big macro scale like this, has a large momentum. So when you take Planck's constant, which has an exponent of 10 to the minus 34, and you divide it by this number, you're gonna get a really small wavelength, right? So 10 to the minus 32nd meters doesn't mean anything for a ball that's, you know, five centimeters across you're not gonna be able to notice this wavelength in real life. Where this is gonna show up is in small scale things. So on an atomic scale, this momentum is gonna be a really small number because the mass of those things is really small. So when you take these numbers and they're really small, this wavelength is gonna be bigger in relation to the object and it's gonna have a physical meaning. So for example, like electrons. Electrons can behave like particles. You can shoot them at things, they have mass, they have charge, right? But electrons have also been shown to diffract if you shine them through a double slit apparatus. X-rays are another example, right? So X-rays are what we think of as just straight waves, right? But the photoelectric effect showed that X-rays in all light can behave like particles. And we also know that if you take X-rays and you shine them through a crystal structure, you'll get a diffraction pattern because the X-ray is diffracting as it goes through the atomic structure of the crystal. So even on a larger scale, neutrons. Neutrons behave like particles in, for example, fission reactions. They smash into other atoms and cause atoms to split but you can actually cause diffraction patterns with neutrons too. And there've been experiments that show the wave nature of neutrons. So all of this comes from the fact that things on an atomic scale, electrons, x-rays, neutrons, all of these things, they're not particles, they're not waves. They have properties of both. So what does that mean? How could something have both particle properties and wave properties? Well, let's start by looking at a wave, right? So here's a wave. And this wave has a wavelength. I can look and measure this wavelength. And we know from de Broglie's equation that wavelength will tell us momentum, okay? So if I ask you to find the wavelength of this equation, that's easy. It's just there or there or there or there, right? But if I say find the position of this wave, you're looking like, what the hell does that mean, right? There is no position for this wave. This wave is everywhere, right? So how can we get a position of a wave? 
Well, if I take another wave and I make it interfere with it, right? So I'm going to draw another wave on top of it that's a little bit different. This wave, when I combine it with this wave, will interfere, kind of like when we studied beats last year. If you look here, I have a crest and a crest kind of matching up, but then there's other points where a crest and a trough are going to match up, kind of like right here. And you'll get parts of constructive and destructive interference. And so if I add more waves, I can get more interference. So if I take all of these waves and I add them up, the net effect, if I take all of these and combine them, is going to give me a wave that has parts that are canceled out and parts that have gotten bigger. And so what that's going to look like is something like this. This is called a wave packet. And a wave packet is basically a combination of all these waves that makes the wave show up in just one spot. So now I have a position for this wave. Here is my position uncertainty. So remember, we talked about wave functions already when we talked about matter waves. This wave function represents the probability of finding a particle somewhere in here. So if this line goes off to zero over here, I know it's not going to be here, and it's going to be somewhere in this space right here. And the big amplitude right here shows me I have a high probability of finding it right here. But now I have a delta x for my wave particle thing. And if I have a delta x, that means I can measure where it's at. But the trade-off is that now that I have a delta x, I had to add a bunch of different wavelengths together to give me that. And so by doing that, adding all these wavelengths together, that changed my momentum. So my uncertainty in momentum has gotten bigger by adding all of these to shrink down that delta x. So I can add more and more and more waves like this, and I can shrink my delta x smaller and smaller and smaller. But as I do that, I increase the uncertainty of my momentum. And in reverse, I can take away waves and I can make my momentum more and more certain, but that's going to spread out my wave packet and it's going to make it harder for me to tell where it's at. So the best example I can show you this with is something we've done before, which is single slit interference. So here I have a single slit that starts wide and it gradually gets narrower. When I shine a laser through the slit, you can see that the interference pattern produced spreads out more as the slit gets narrower. The width of the slit tells us the uncertainty in the position of each photon when it goes through. A wider slit means there's more uncertainty as to where the photon is located, while a smaller slit means I know more about where the photons are. Each photon that passes through the slit has an X component and a Y component of momentum. The uncertainty of the X component, which is in the up and down direction here, is related to the uncertainty in the width of the slit through the uncertainty principle. When the slit is large, the higher uncertainty in the location of each photon leads to a lower uncertainty in the momentum of each photon in the up and down direction. This causes the photons to make a tight pattern since their momenta are all close to each other. When the slit is narrow, I know more about where the photons are, so the position uncertainty is small, but the trade-off is that now there's more uncertainty in the up and down momentum of each photon that comes through, which causes the pattern to be more spread out in the up and down direction. Position and momentum aren't the only things that follow the uncertainty principle. Energy and time also follow the uncertainty principle. So, the uncertainty in an energy measurement times the uncertainty in a time measurement is also greater than or equal to h over 4 pi. What this means is, on a small enough time scale, the energy of a point in space is not necessarily zero. So what you have is particles popping into and out of existence, and that means that empty space isn't really empty. So this has actually been observed in a lab. It's called the Casimir effect. So if you take two metal plates and you put them about 1 times 10 to the minus 6 meters apart. It's a micrometer. What's going to happen is inside of these plates, because of this uncertainty principle, you're going to have particles pop into and out of existence. But these particles, when they appear, they have to have some multiple, their wavelength has to be some multiple of the, the width of the plates, right? So they're confined to having only specific wavelengths. But outside the plates, you can have whatever wavelength you want of particle with certain energy pop into and out of existence. And so the result is you're going to have more push on the outside from particles popping into and out of existence than you do inside. And the net result is that these two plates are going to get pushed together by some net force from this. And you can actually see this in the lab, and it shows that empty space isn't really empty. So if you remember anything from this about the uncertainty principle, we're using this for measuring, yes, but the uncertainty principle isn't fundamentally about measurement. The uncertainty principle is about the fundamental nature of things on an atomic scale and how they behave as both particles and waves.